How do you manage yourself if you have a tendency to emotionally self-abandon? How do you remain attached to yourself? So I would, I would actually direct you back to the experientials in the course on healing attachment wounds. This is, those are all demonstrations of how I recommend it. And, and, and maybe creating space and time in your day that you carve out, that you have a conversation with yourself you know, dear self, or some people like to use inner child work. So they might say, dear little, whatever your name is, right? So for me, dear little Brianna, I just want to check in with you today and find out how you are doing. I'm noticing that we've been in kind of an overwhelmed, this is actually, I'm actually talking to myself right now. We've been in kind of an overwhelmed and overworked place lately. And I'm, I'm also noticing that I've been having kind of this blah attitude lately. And I'm, now starting to listen to the blah and realize that that's you asking for my attention. So what can we, what can I do today that will show you that I'm listening and that you are as important to me as any of the other things I'm doing in the external world and as any of the other things that I am offering up in service to my partner or to the people that my family members or the people who are in my sphere. And, you know, we can use, I don't know that I share this in healing attachment specifically, but I have on other calls. You can use dominant and non-dominant handwriting as a way to have that conversation. So on the, the, with the right hand, you might say, dear little Brianna, I'm noticing we're in kind of a blah mood lately. And I've also been feeling kind of overwhelmed. And I'm just wondering if this is something, if this is a message from you and there's something that I need to be attending to. Well, big Brianna, <laughs> I feel as if this is going great, but if you could attend more to your physical well-being and give me a couple moments of pleasure throughout the day, I could deal with this a little bit better. Uh, and then right hand, okay, little Brianna, I hear you. Can you be a little more specific on one thing I could do today that would bring you pleasure and make it easier to handle our expanding workload? I think I would like you to take a hot bath and go to the movies. Turn off your computer at 5 p.m. and go to the movies, movies and just let yourself turn off for a few hours. Okay. So it can be, it doesn't have to be this big, grand, esoteric thing that you have to learn and do. Sometimes it's just like a small thing that you derive pleasure from, but it, it, it's also you attending to that inner person, that inner place, the aspect of you, and in some ways acknowledge, surrendering to and acknowledging that there are aspects of you that are not part of the waking self. Um, and, you know, sometimes we tend to think of our, our ego mind, which is our waking mind, the part that thinks the thoughts as being who we really are. We're really identified with that part of ourselves. That's how I think is who I am. But really who you are is the part of you that observes those thoughts. And if, and that's the, obser the inner observer. And so the part of you that observes those thoughts can also observe what's going on in the body, can also observe what your feelings may have to say about those thoughts and realize that those can be, and it helps I think to perceive those parts as having their own consciousness within you. That your observing self is actually aware of a constellation of consciousnesses within you, okay? And that oftentimes when we experience something profound, that there's a charge that gets tied up in it. And then that charge and that experience collects new information, right? So for example, if you think of attachment, we'll talk about this from an attachment perspective. Our, under, our, our cognitive psychic, even emotional constructs are like a blueprint, the way that we see, perceive, interpret information. That becomes a blueprint in our minds. And typically from zero to five, maybe six or seven, we establish a blueprint for how we receive and interpret information. This is according to developmental theory, which I teach personality development at the graduate level. So that's that's more or less the ages within which we establish that foundational blueprint then every cycle of development after that adolescence young adulthood what i call new adulthood um uh, midlife older age um then then being in the more senior years then stepping into the phases of life review and then death and dying all of these are like cycles of new attachment experiences and the first zero to five, six, seven years is the foundational blueprint. And then as that blueprint moves 
into the next cycle of development, it starts collecting new information and adding it onto that foundation. So your house, I'm using the house as a metaphor for self, starts to be constructed in a certain way. Now, at any given time, and I believe this is totally true and why we have such tremendous free will, at any time you can renovate that house. You can knock out a wall. You can decide, I don't like the way the kitchen looks anymore, I'm gonna renovate, right? So, so uh, this is what I mean by um, that we have these different aspects of self. And in order to renovate that house, you kind of have to think about what would I want to put there in its place. And this is where you start to have conversations with different aspects of yourself. In Jungian psychology, they're referred to as archetypes, for example. So an archetype is, uh, according to Jung, there are universal archetypes. And that means that every human being cross-culturally will recognize this sort of psychic constellation. So for example, if I were to show you a picture of a woman, any woman, holding a baby, almost everyone from whatever country or culture or ethnic background they come from will read it as mother holding child. That's how they will read it. But you don't know that. You don't know that. The woman could be childless. She could just be holding the baby of her sister. She could be, um, it could just be that she's a nurse in a waiting room holding the baby for the mom to come pick up the baby. You know, we, there, we, it's in a, you might think it's an erroneous assumption, but when we look at woman holding child, we interpret it as mother. That's a universal archetype. So all of us have this, these things floating around in our collective unconscious, then you will have your personal experience of mother. That will be all of the experiences that you had with your own mother, and then maybe with a friend's mother, and then maybe with your aunt who's a mother. All of those then become glommed on to that universal archetype, right? And then you will have a particular relationship to that constellation. It's become a house built on a blueprint, okay? So we have that, that mechanism plays itself out for a variety of different aspects in our life. And then those different archetypes and constellations exist within you. And that makes up your unconscious self and your subconscious self, and even in some ways your conscious self. And they all are in conversation with one another. It's just until we take a mindful moment out to, to rest in the observing aspect of ourselves, until we do that, they're talking almost like behind the wall. Like you don't hear what they're saying, but they are talking and sometimes they're fighting and sometimes they're getting along. And, and unless you are able to step into the observing self, it's gonna be hard to hear what they're saying. But once you're able to hear what they're saying, then you can better meet their needs. And that's when you start to feel better about what's going on for you.